I think it is, unfortunately, it is those people who some parts of the population chose to elect last November. It it does seem like we've we're in a different place than lot. Even you know we look at America, which seems to track similarly to us. Um, there they've got people back in in grounds. You know, it might only be five thousand or fifteen thousand or you know whatever. It's 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 reduced attendances, but they've got people back in grounds. You look at the NRL semi-finals, and those grounds were visibly quite full at the weekend. Well, they would have been in a you know if you if you compared the attendances to an attend most attendances here, they easily be in the top 10 crowds all year if well, not there was 30,000 um on sun on saturday at, at anz that's a decent day of magic isn't it yeah yeah anyway um hopefully things will get sorted people will uh get some decisions right and the public can have something to get behind and follow because so far we haven't had much but credit for I- the... sorry go on yeah, and I hope we can get people, you know, if, if we can't get them in, we can give them something, some way of, of engaging and keeping them engaged. Because I think the danger is that the longer this whole shenanigan goes on, the more people will drift away and either find other hobbies or just it'll lose from their minds. And, and we'll be facing a situation where, you know, when we, we had a low base in terms of, of, of crowds, that it crowds once they are allowed to be fully back they might be even lower unfortunately and especially if you think of the older population those that will be shielding and etc and that kind of thing and the people unfortunately that we have lost when you take those into consideration and people that drifting away it's it's a big danger for the long-term sustainability of the sport at the lower end yeah there there, there is worries about habits changing and things like that so you know, when we can get I've, back in, let's. let's I've, I've push definitely this noticed the, it. Yeah. yeah, in some of the things I I was involved in, that I just don't feel the same way as I did pre-pandemic, and I don't. I just don't even know there's versions of them on, and there's things to get involved. I don't feel as engaged with certain things as I did, and I think that will be the case for a lot of people. Oh, without without a doubt, yeah, without a doubt. Um, create rub, to love rugby league and total RL and BBC rugby league for their reporting and then obviously the rfl website as well as a good source of news that's where we pulled the, the uh statement straight from the rfl press release for that last piece there um apart from the kind of slagging off the government bits they didn't mention those bits in their press release but we're now going to move on to what will be a relatively rapid fire super league match reviews <laughs> So we've got round 16 to talk about and a game that I think was supposed to be it was supposed to be in round 9 but I don't know where they're classifying it as now because Cass played in in round 9 against someone else in the end um, when Hull FC were unavailable but we'll get to all that. <laughs> I think I think this year trying to trying to stick to round numbers is probably a, a folly that we don't need to to go down. I think with round numbers are all over the place. They should just do a pick a number before the game. I wonder what league where League Express put it. They put it as round 9 as well but um, so Cass played twice in round nine this year. Uh, for the first game we're going to talk about, we're going to go all the way back to last Tuesday afternoon, Tim, and it was Hulkingston Rovers against Salford. It was another game that Salford lost uh, due to a refereeing decision close to the end. There was That involved Paulie Paulie, but there was no doubt about this one. Um, it was 24-22 to the Robins. It was 12-6 to the Robins at half time. So they kind of, they kind of led the way throughout in this one. James Child was the referee. In terms of the stats, other than seven more errors, stats have Rovers as deserved winners in this game. Nearly 400 more metres at almost one metres per carry better average gain, as well as twice as many successful offloads. And then four more breaks, and although they only won with a penalty goal, they made more chances they deserved it. Yeah. Individually. Ben Crooks, Blondie Ben Crooks with a try, eight tackle bus, 206 metres, three clean breaks. Kane Linnett with two try assists, six tackle bus, 138 metres, three clean breaks, three successful offloads. Mikey Lewis, was he at full back in this game? I think he was, wasn't he? Um, yes, I think he was. Yeah, and apparently, I did see on Twitter the first game he'd ever played at full back in his life, so he didn't do badly for that. 
No, and Jordan Abdul seemed to start in the centres as weird, weird team positions, but um, it, it worked out, didn't it? Uh, Mikey Lewis, two tries, five tackle balls, 145 metres. One of those two tries was a penalty try. Elliot Minchella, 43 tackles, 10 of which were marker tackles. On the losing Salford side, there was um, a few of their backups in, but a couple of their first teamers played as well in the build-up to the Wembley game. But Oli Ashall Bot came in at full-back. He had a try, a try assist, nine tackle balls, 132 metres and two clean breaks. Seb Ikehihifo had seven tackle balls on 135 metres. Ryan Lannan with 113 metres. And Luke Gates with a barn sum in try and 101 metres. And we got a fan review. We did. It was from Tom Andrews who said, entertaining end-to-end game between Rovers, Randoms and Salford Reserves. For us, thought that Linnett and Hadley were very good and Ashelbot stood out for Salford. Will Mayer looked all right too. Ellis had his usual awful performance hidden by good kicks. Leaving Paulie on so long was always going to leave him shagged and giving even more penalties away than usual. So cheers for that, Ian. Only two wins behind the undefeated in Bunny Mark's Cass. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I've only seen the highlights of this one not being a season ticket holder of either side. Um, so it's hard to talk too much about star players, but we know the Albert Goldfort points went three to Kane Linnett, two to Luke Gates, and one to Ollie Ashall. But um, what, what from, did you see? From, yeah, I, I listened to a little bit on BBC Radio Humberside for the 10 minutes or so that I can stand of of that. And then um, I, think, I think the phone went or something happened and I drifted away from it and then I watched the highlights the only real talking point for me in this game was the penalty try and to me that did look on the softer side I, I, just from the angle that we had it just looked it looked like it was fair competition going for the ball that he held him back it didn't look like it was malicious enough for a, a penalty try but I think if it wasn't a penalty try it would have had to have been a simbin in because there was definite contact made by um, Ashall Bot on Mikey Lewis who was the favourite to get to the ball but the bounce of the ball was quite steep wasn't it so I'm not sure if Lewis would have got it and got it down in time um, having said that I'm, I, it had to be punished one way or another I think on the grainy YouTube highlights it did look a bit uncertain but when I saw it on the high definition sky highlights during the coverage later that night it looked more clear cut to me Fair enough. There was a few other things, I think, to talk about from the highlights. I mean, Linnett busting through for Lewis's try that started the scoring was impressive. I, mean, I think Lewis's support play looked good, didn't it? Hadley could have put him in for another try um, not long after, but Hadley didn't make the pass. But thankfully, Lewis got in at WR, spread the ball out wide for Crook to score on the next play. Anyway, um, it probably would be unfair not to mention Ashall Bot's elusive footwork for his score if we're sort of calling him on the... Um, on the, well, if we're talking about the penalty try, you have to talk about the flip side and and the, his speed going sideways was ridiculous. <laughs> and and this is yeah, I mean he he doesn't look out of place as a Super League player at all. And I think he's going to Ottawa next year. Um, it is Ottawa, isn't it? Yeah, I think yeah. Uh, but you've got to think he's he's someone who who has a future in Super League, surely. Yeah, it's just he hasn't... He still seems so tiny. Um, but Adam Quinlan's tiny, and he does well right. in the fullback position, doesn't he? So, you know, he's, he's, got, he's got someone to model his game on there if he, if he looks around. Um, Haraki's offload for Abdul's try. That was that was a nice bit of play as well. I, Hull KR look better with Abdul in the side, don't they? Yeah, I, th- yeah. I think they, they look better, better overall. I think it was it was closer than in scoreline than perhaps the, the flow of the game suggested and I think the the penalty at the end was uh, quite justified well let's move on to another game won by another late penalty that maybe was a little bit more controversial but uh, we'll get to that do you want to take us through the scores and stats yep so it finished Hull FC 18 Huddersfield 16 having been 10-4 to the black and whites at half time Scott Mickey Mouse cast was your referee for this one and in terms of the team statistics with a better average gain and team tackle success rate, one more break plus one fewer offload and almost 500 more metres. Stats say Hull maybe could have won by more, but deserved their win nonetheless. For that winning black and white side, 
Carlos Tomb of Arvo, one try assist, 196 metres and three offloads. Jamie Shaw, five tackle busts, 180 metres, three offloads. Joe Cater made 50 tackles, 11 of those at marker and ran for a full Nelson, 111 metres. And Josh Griffin chipped in with two try assists and running for 138 metres himself. On the losing Huddersfield side, Brandon Moore made... 45 tackles and none of those were missed. Ash Golding ran for 120 metres. Matty English and his giant head scored one try and ran for 121 metres. And Sam Notterhooker Wood mm-hmm. ran for 100 metres. Um, Carsten got in touch to say Huddersfield can't win a close match again and the shoulder charge should have been a sin bin. Does Inspector Colombo uh, do, do the half time show now? <laughs> if you if you uh, don't get that reference it's due to uh, the mac that um brian carney was wearing making him look like he was uh, being followed by a pink panther um not david vafita uh paul mac underscore 78 said another game huddersfield lose by converted trial less dummy half service for caesar's late field goal attempt was horrible really missing crews yeah i mean brandon moore put as much effort as he could into this his, his first Super League game um, on debut for the Giants but the, the pass was bad the kick was bad um, yeah it wasn't ideal uh, for Caesar. he had, had a, a decent game hadn't he um, the shoulder charge that Carson mentioned that's right in Longo. he's got a grade A charge for that but that comes with it no pe- no matches in a penalty notice I feel like Ratu's got previous on the shoulder charge so I'm surprised he gets no games, um, but but yeah, you can't really argue with that game pulled out. He, he seems to be a bit shouldery. It's, it doesn't matter because we're not going to see him soon. But um, <laughs> but yeah, uh, star players on this one. Uh, Griffin got three Albert Goldfoot points. Snake got two. Caesar got one. But I I thought Carlos Tumavavi seemed to be back in form for me. I do think all the pivots were pretty decent for Hull. Um, and it, it felt like they were the better side and deserved the win, even if there was some debate over the winning penalty. So I suppose we should talk about that winning penalty. What what did you make of the um, of the call there? Do we even know what the penalty was for? Was it for um, McQueen in the rook, or was it for the moral moral vacuum being offside, not square? To me, it looked like it was the it was the ruck infringement from from when I just watched it briefly. But I, 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 it could be either way around. To be honest, yeah, I think it was the ruck infringement. He wanted to let play on, but Huddersfield, but Hull didn't want to play on because <laughs> they knew they had a kickable penalty. So I think Hull kind of forced the ref's hand there to to not really get on with the play. So he had to had to blow the penalty for the man li- lying in the ruck. Um, I do think few highlight moments in the game I mean Griffin's hands for the Fenua opening uh, Fenua's first try not the opening try that was no longer but Fenua's first try on, on stroke of half time I mean that was great hands from uh, Josh Griffin and he repeated the dose again in the second half for Faremo's try as well unbelievably Faremo's first try of the season it feels like he jumps off the stat sheet with his effort with his you know exit set plays but he isn't getting the ball at the top end of the field but he managed to um get a try but all of those great hands from Griffin had nothing on Matty English's hands for his try where he picked up the the knee kick from Caesar perfectly out of the air and it led to some banter in the commentary box too with the uh, in- Inspector Gadget jibes <laughs> <laughs> yeah it did yeah it, well w- w- so which which way are down are you coming Inspector Gadget or Inspector Clouseau I, I'm on the Gadget side of things I think I'm, I'm enjoying that one I think so. I think if you, yeah, he's, he's quite competent, is Brian Carney, and he was quite quite good at sort of getting to balls he shouldn't, certainly laterally, not so much in the air, but uh, certainly laterally, he used his Gaelic football skills to get hold of it. So I, I think, uh, yeah, it's, it's those go-go gadget arms. Um, but the skill from English, I mean, it was a good kick. Skill for, yeah. I think... How many props do you see do that? It was, it was brilliant. Yeah, and I, I wonder if he's someone who could slip into in more of a 13 role in in, for, in future he's got something about him he's got some skill he's got some handling ability i wonder if he could be quite a destructive 13 in as 
you know, similar as we've seen the sort of evolution of of Cater sort of from the other way around, having come from a half and going into that 